Welcome to Line Upon Line, brought to you by It Is Written. This is where we get to answer your Bible questions. Yes, there is good news, and here are a few verses that might be helpful to you. Here's what you got to know. God loves you anyway. He's with you anyway. So let's kind of unpack this and look at the tenses just a little bit. Oh, that's a good question. Thank you for joining us for Line Upon Line, brought to you by It Is Written. This is where we answer your Bible questions, and we have some great questions today. If you've been watching Line Upon Line and you thought, those questions aren't very good, well, there's something that you can do about it. A, adjust your attitude, or B, email us. Send us what you consider to be a really good question. The email address is lineuponline at iiw.org, lineuponline at iiw.org, and we'll do our level best to give you a Bible answer for your Bible questions. Joining me, Eric Flickinger from It Is Written. Thanks for being here. It's good to be here, John. We've got some great questions today, some deep questions. All right. Which is not to suggest that the other questions that we have are very shallow. Sure. But today we are excited to have some great questions, and the first one comes from Sissel. Thank you, Sissel, for sending us this question. Speaking of deep questions, why did God make us? He knew what was going to happen. Yes, we have a free will, but to be born is not our choice. Sissel, let's flip this. Why did God make us, knowing all of the awful things that were going to happen to us? No. Why did God make us, knowing all of the awful things that were going to happen to him? Because Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. As soon as there was sin, there was a savior. It was planned that should sin happen, should the unthinkable happen, then Jesus would come to this earth and live as a man. And he would, by the grace of God, live a perfect life so that he might have his perfect righteousness to give to us. But he would die for us. It wasn't just some garden variety death. Your great-grandma was fortunate that she went to bed late one night and fell asleep, didn't wake up, died in her sleep. Oh, not Jesus. Mm. He died because his heart ruptured within himself. They pressed a crown of thorns on his head. They whipped him and beat him. And it's, imagine they snatched out his beard as he walked by. Jesus was brutally treated. And the truth of the matter is that the physical treatment was not nearly the worst part about his death. That's he, right. He bore our sins, and, and that was so crushing. He felt like he was indeed separated from his father. So we're reframing the question, and we're asking, why did God do this knowing what he would go through? There can only be one answer. That answer is because of love. And he wanted to spend eternity with us. The only way that that could happen is, is for us to be here. I, I imagine it to some extent, it must have been lonely for God in forever in the past when it was only Him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He began to create things, angels and so forth. And then there came a time when He said, you know, I, I want to create someone very much like me. I want to create man. And, and He created us in His image. He created us like Him so that He could love us and we could love Him in return. And part of that creation, the way he created us to, to make love possible or for love to be possible was to give us a free will, a choice. Because without choice, without free will, there can't be love. We would simply be programmed beings, automatons, if you will, computer programs to simply do what God programmed us to do. But he gave us free will so that we could love him and he could love us. It's a fair question, knowing all the trouble that was going to come up, knowing that there'd be AIDS babies and kids born with fetal alcohol syndrome and spina bifida and all of that, car crashes and muggings and murders and suicide. And Why in the world did God go through with it? Well, I don't know how many brothers and sisters you have, Cecil. Why did your parents have so many children? Might have only been one, two, seven, I don't know why. They knew full well that there was a very, very good chance that one of them could have been born disabled. They knew full well that one of them might go off the rails. One of them could end up in prison for the rest of her life or his life. Someone could do something dastardly, have a rotten experience, suffer from an illness. There's something about love 
you know, you're going to love anyway, no matter what your children do with their lives, you're going to love them. Whatever they experience, you're going to love them. It's just like that with God. God knew that whosoever believed in Jesus would not perish but have everlasting life. There's something about love that we don't understand and something about the love of God that we wrestle with. God saw in every human being born the possibility that that person could be saved. Let's look beyond the temporary difficulties of this earth. Paul wrote about our light affliction, which is but for a moment. James said that life is but a vapor, appears for a moment and then vanishes away. God was thinking what happens on this earth is not really the main point. He knew that whatever happened on this earth, if we allow it, it would push us towards God and not away from God. We had the opportunity to be saved. And that's what God wanted. Eric Sissel writes at the end of a question, to be born is not our choice. Oh man, what a fantastic thing that God said, you don't have a choice, so I'm going to bring you into the world and give you the opportunity to have everlasting life. That's right. The, the other alternative, the alternative to not having a choice is absolute nothingness for forever. You would not have existed. You would never have the opportunity to have eternal life. So he brought you into existence so you could live forever. Let's take a look at Genesis. How did God bring us, that is humanity, into existence? Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Well, of course God didn't, how did, how did you phrase it? To be born is not our choice. You're right, it wasn't our choice because we weren't around before we came into being. There wasn't some sort of a, a soul, a spirit flitting and floating around the universe waiting for God to make a body to put us in that he could consult with us and say, do you want to be born? Right. We, we just plain didn't exist until we existed. And so God in his mercy and his love and his grace gave us an opportunity that we never had, never would have had, if we had never existed. It reminds me of a true story. A man in Wyoming died, evidently died from hypothermia. He was homeless. And some kids found him. They were tobogganing. I guess they were up on the high part of the, maybe the river, and they were down the hill. They found a man under the bridge. They thought he was sleeping, and then they realized he wasn't asleep. He was dead homeless man. He didn't have a roof over his head and he didn't have money in his pocket. Here's what he didn't know. A great aunt who lived in New York City had died a few years before or some time before. She was very wealthy. She had very few relatives. She had the attorney search for her family members and they discovered this guy, homeless man in Wyoming. He did not know. He died not knowing that he was rich. Just didn't know. He could have bought the biggest supermarket in that town and the other one and had tons of money left over. He could have bought the 10 most expensive homes in that town. He could have bought every clothing store in that town and still had money left over if he'd made any one of those purchases. He didn't know that he was fabulously wealthy and he died hungry, alone, and freezing cold. It reminds me, Cecil, of a lot of people in this world. They just don't know what they've got. Jesus died so that we might live forever. He's gifted to us. He's bequeathed to us everlasting life. If we claim that everlasting life, it becomes ours. He says, salvation is yours. Do you want it? And why in the world would people not? I know this can be challenging these questions of existence and foreknowledge and predestination and the will of God and the will of human beings. If you look at this thing from God's point of view, you'll say, wow, God is really good. God is love and he's given us far more than we deserve. Sethi writes, is there one God? That's a short question, but boy, does it ever get to the heart of, of what Christianity is all about. Is there one God? The short answer, yes. Who is he? Okay, not so short now. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah, but how do you know that? And how do you know that the three are one God? Now we know because in the Bible, Jesus referred to his Father again 
and again and again. My father worketh hitherto and I work. I'm, I'm going to my father in my father's house. And there's no question that the father is God. So is the father God? Yes. Is only the father God? No. Let's talk about the son. The son is also God. He said, I and my father are one. So he's making himself equal with the father. He, before Abraham was, he said, I am. Am. Referring to the fact that he is the self-existent God. That's right, absolutely. So he, Jesus is just as verily God as the Father is. Absolutely. Now, what about this, this third person, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit? I'm going to say, you are going to say that he, and he is he, is God. How do we validate that? Well, of course, you've got You've got the Father, you've got the Son, the third person of the Godhead. How do we know that? There's a story in the book of Acts that's very, very interesting. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. They had sold a piece of land. They had agreed to give the money to the church. Then they decided to keep back some of the money, and they got caught. Yeah. They got caught. And when they got caught, Peter said to them, listen, when the money was yours, when the, house, the land was yours, you could have done anything with it that you wanted to. But you were a little dishonest. In fact, you were a lot dishonest in what you, you did with it. You decided to keep some of the blessings from the church, but keep the money to yourself, some of the money to yourself as well. And he said, you lied to the Holy Spirit. And when you lied to the Holy Spirit, you lied to God. And that was a big mistake. In fact, they dropped dead right there. Yeah. It's clear from the Bible that the Spirit is God as well. And the Spirit is a person. Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as a person numerous times. When he, the spirit of truth is coming. He will guide people into all truth. So, Eric, in certain circles, there are little movements that rise up and say, oh, we don't believe this Godhead concept. Some call it the Trinity. Mm -hmm. We don't believe the Trinity. One reason for that is because the Trinity is a very popular belief within the Roman Catholic Church. And some people say, well, if I believe the Trinity, then I'm signing off on all Roman Catholic teaching, and I don't agree with all Roman Catholic teaching, and so I don't want to be guilty by association. It doesn't matter who teaches it. It just matters if it's true. And that's what you want to keep in mind. You'll find you, that you have uh, beliefs in common with all kinds of interesting individuals, and that doesn't make you on the same page as those folks in every aspect. So that's one reason. Yep. Why else are people getting off on this thing? Uh, this idea that the Holy Spirit is not a person of the Godhead, but is rather a, a force or something that, that emanates from, from the Son or something like that. It, it, when we can demote the Holy Spirit, we don't always have to do everything that the Holy Spirit tells us to do. Sure. Uh, and if I want to do the things I want to do, and here is someone or something trying to convict me that I need to change, it's not always the most comfortable feeling. Another thing is this. The idea that there are three beings and they comprise one God, that's, I mean, that's honestly, it's a little complicated. It's simple. Three is one, but it's not the way that we think in the Western world. Sometimes people will look at this and go, it's just far too complicated, and they feel like they cannot understand it, and so they throw the baby out with the bathwater. We would encourage you to do otherwise. Hang on to the plainly revealed truths in the Word of God. Even if they challenge you, let God reveal them to you in the fullness of time. This is Line Upon Line from It Is Written, and we will be back with more in just a moment. Discover the powerful ways that God is part of the healing process. Go beyond what the media and popular trends say about healthcare and learn from an expert what it really means to be healthy. In his book, The Ultimate Prescription, Dr. James L. Markham explains some of the common misconceptions about healthcare that are prevalent in our society today, how you can avoid them, and how to take care of the spiritual dimension of your health. To order The Ultimate Prescription, call 888-664-5573 or visit itiswritten.shop. Thank you for remembering that It Is Written exists because of the kindness of people just like you. To support this international life-changing ministry, please call us now at 800-253-3000. You can send your tax-deductible gift to the address on your screen, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. Thank you for your prayers and for your financial support. Our number again is 800-253-3000 you could visit us online at itiswritten.com. Welcome back to Line Upon Line, brought to you by It Is Written. Thank you once again 
for sending your questions to us. And if you would like to and you haven't yet done it, please do send them to us line upon line at IIW.org. We look forward to receiving your questions. Colin asks this. Many people think we should baptize people in only the name of Jesus. Jesus clearly said we should baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is correct. And if I would have a run at that question, I would say, Colin is saying, who's correct, Jesus or people? Well, if, if I have to choose between Jesus and people, I'm probably going to choose Jesus. But it's a, a, a mildly leading question. Sure it is. So, so let's see if we can unpack it a little bit. You're right, Colin, there are people who, who put in what we might say an undue emphasis on the words that are spoken, the utterances that are spoken at a person's baptism. Does it matter that the correct words are spoken, the exact words? Well, we're going to look at some examples in the Bible, but let me preface what we're about to share by, by asking you to consider this. If it's all about the syllables, the utterances, the words that are said during a baptism, there's a high likelihood that we should not be baptizing anybody in the English language. Because back in Jesus' day, I don't know how many of them spoke English to baptize anyone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My guess is about zero. Here's what we know. Some people like to argue, and they like to argue about nothing. And what you've got to do as a believer in Jesus or as somebody who is finding his or her way in faith in God is to figure out what's worth arguing about, what's not. Pretty easy. Nothing's worth arguing about. So the question then would be, what's worth making a big deal over and what's not? Well, let's allow the Bible to answer that question for us. I'm going to read to you Acts 2 and verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so the question is, what was he getting at? Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, let's back up ever so slightly. The Bible talks about David in verse 34. David has not ascended into the heavens and so forth. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus, who you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Are, are, you, are, you, are you feeling me? God has made Jesus Lord and Christ. This was the controversy. This was the dispute. Who is Messiah? Who is Lord and Christ? Peter is saying it's Jesus. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked, convicted in their hearts, and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what do we do? You've just told us that Jesus is the Messiah. What do we do? And they answered by saying, be baptized in the name of Jesus. Yep. They weren't saying, well, wait, let me write this down for you. Go get baptized and tell the vicar when he baptizes you to say these words. He was saying, when you're baptized, be baptized accepting Jesus as the Messiah. In another question not that long ago on another program, we were talking about how to study the Bible. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned, when you study, study in context. Whatever, whether you go chapter by chapter, topic by topic, make sure you get the context right. The context here demonstrates to you that we're not arguing or or mandating a certain phraseology be used in the baptistry. Right. The concept is when a person is being baptized in the name of Jesus, that person is being baptized accepting Jesus Christ as her or his Savior. You can find in the Bible, in the book of Acts, same book, where they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's right. Same book, book of Acts, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. Again, baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So you've gone to flop, to flip, to flop. Yep, different times, different things were said at different times. And nowhere in the book of Acts or anywhere else that I've found in the New Testament, after somebody is baptized, does, does somebody else step up and say, hey, hey, wait, wait a minute, no, time out, uh-uh, no, that doesn't count. Go back and do that one again. If the person is sincere, if they have accepted Jesus as their personal savior, if they have a relationship and want a deepening relationship with the Father, if they are being led by the Spirit, whether they're baptized in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, whether they're baptized in English or in Spanish 
or in Russian or in whatever language, if that sincerity is there, if the surrender is there, if the desire is there, even if the pastor messes it up a little bit, I'll give you an example. I heard a story of a, a man who is a, a Spanish-speaking gentleman, wanted to be baptized, had accepted Jesus as his Savior, and, and wanted to give his life in a public way to let everybody know that he loved Jesus and wanted to follow him. But he couldn't find a Spanish-speaking pastor. He could oh. only find an English-speaking pastor. And so he asked him in his broken English, could you baptize me in Spanish? And the, the English-speaking pastor said, well, I can, I can try. I'll do my very best. And so he went back and he, and he studied and he, and he practiced and he, he wrote it down and he, he memorized. Now, my Spanish is not all that great. It should probably be better than it is. But unless I'm mistaken, when a person is baptized in Spanish, they are baptized in el nombre del Padre y el Hijo y el Espíritu Santo, or something along those lines. And so the pastor, on the day of the baptism, young Spanish-speaking gentleman coming into the baptistry, he's about to baptize him. He raises his hand in the air, and he says, I now baptize you in el nombre de la Papa. In the name of the daddy. Uh, uh, the name of the, the Pope. In the name of the Pope? In the name of the Pope. Oh, fantastic. Or the potato, depending on how you want to translate it. Either way, I don't see, I don't see God up there in heaven going, oh, no, 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 that's, that doesn't work. What I think I see is the angels of heaven going, <laughs> did you see that one? <laughs> that was a good one, right? It counts. The young man was sincere. The pastor was sincere. Their hearts were in the right place. A little, something was lost in translation, Yeah, but it counts. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations or make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. I'd hang with what Jesus said. And I think Eric, you summed that up very nicely. I wouldn't encourage you to get baptized in the name of the potato or in the name of the Pope. But if that's how it comes out, one more second on this. Somebody might be tempted to say, well, they said it's not important. I think it's important. Sure. It's sure. all important. But just don't make it a life and death issue or a test case or, or that's how it's got to be forever. And yeah. Exhale. Relax a little bit about this subject. Eric, Theseus is writing. Help me understand the 144,000 of Revelation chapter 7. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to try to do this in a short period of time, which is about impossible, but we'll do our very best. We'll do our best. So the 144,000 are mentioned by name twice in the book of Revelation. Uh -huh. Once in Revelation chapter 7 and again in Revelation chapter 14. They're referred to at, uh, at a few other times as well. But who are the 144,000? Let's answer a common question first. Is it a literal number? Is it literally 144,000 that are going to be saved? Or is this more of a symbolic number? I think we have to come down on the idea, on the side of the idea that it's a symbolic number. Because if you look at in, in Revelation where the 144,000 are described, they are described as having their father's name written in their foreheads. They're described as being virgins. They're described as being 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. There's so much there that's symbolic. You'd think that the number is symbolic as well. So we will go on the side of symbolic and we're pretty confident about that. Yeah, so likely a symbolic number. Now, what are their characteristics? John, you made mention that they were uh, of the tribes of Israel. You made mention that they are virgins. These are all symbols. So who are the 144,000? In a nutshell, this is the group of people who live through the very end of time, through the seven last plagues, through the trials and the tribulations, to see Jesus come in the clouds of heaven. Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 7. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. Verse 1 says, after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So these individuals, they receive the seal of God. That is, they do not receive the mark of the beast. That's at the very end of time. Right. And Jesus comes back very shortly after that. So the 144,000 lived through Earth's last great crisis. They stand for Christ, 
They've surrendered to him. They are alive and saved when Jesus comes back. The 144,000 are the living saved when Jesus returns. I've heard that the 144,000 will be evangelists who evangelize the world. And maybe you can get there from here, but it's pretty unnecessary. They're the saved when Jesus returns. It's that simple, really, isn't it? Really. Outstanding. All right. You said we'd take a long question and make it short. I think you're right. I think we did that. Right. Jay, how can a promise given to Joshua be claimed by me today? How can a promise given to Joshua way back then be claimed by us today? Well, we're in a bit of a fix, a bit of a pickle. If only the things that are recorded in the Bible applied to the people that they were written to back in those days, we would have a very dusty book here today yeah. that wouldn't be of much practical value. Absolutely. Fortunately, the things that were written back then were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. We are living in the last days of Earth's history. This book, this volume, this Bible is given to us to prepare us for the times that we live in today and the times that are coming in the near future. Those promises can help us. Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1 and verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be the partakers of the divine or you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Peter is writing the promises in the Bible are for you today, which is outstanding. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself. Jesus was speaking to a circle of people gathered around him, but he was speaking to you as well. Quickly now, promises in the Bible that we can claim today. I love the one that you just mentioned, John 14, verses 1 through 3. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Beautiful. One of my favorites. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. It's talking about Christ more than about you, but there's the promise. Yep. Verse 19. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Powerful. With God, all things are possible. You may be facing some trials, some struggles, some challenges in your life, and you're going, I don't know how I can do I've struggled with this. I've failed with this over and over. With God, all things are possible. Trust him. Grab a hold of him. He can see you through. Proverbs chapter 3. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, it says, help me, Proverbs chapter 3, uh, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. I was thinking about five seconds ago. <laughs> Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Powerful promise. Powerful promise. Thanks so much for joining us with Eric Flickinger. I'm John Bradshaw. This has been Line Upon Line. Join us next time. Brought to you by It Is Written. <laughs>